Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I can't thank enough, thank the Lord enough for uh, being able to preach after such uh, great reminders of the grace and the mercy, the goodness of the Lord Jesus. Where would we be today had God not saved us? Oh, my, my. Thank him for his grace today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews and chapter number 10. Hebrews and chapter number 10. I heard about a granddaddy who was uh, talking to his grandson one day, and he said, you know, grandson, he said, back in the good old days, you could take a quarter and go down to the store, and you could buy a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, and a new bicycle. He said, but can't do that anymore. There are too many surveillance cameras. (laughs) I've told you a number of years uh, about my adolescence, about some of the things in my childhood, that kind of stuff. And one of the traps that I fell into was a performance trap. I, I really wanted to prove to God that I was worthy. Uh, I fell into that performance trap of saying, you know what, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I am a good guy. And, and so I, I, I started doing good stuff, started doing this, that, and the other, trying to earn my way into a position of acceptance with God. It was a very futile, uh, really one of the most frustrating seasons in all of my life. I've been watching the uh, uh, television commercials. We're already advertising the 2020 Olympics. And and, you know, uh, 2020 Olympics are about performers. Uh, They've been working very hard, training extremely hard, doing their very best. And then they're going to go before the world stage and they're going to perform in their area of expertise. Uh, I I believe in Christendom today, in Christianity today. Uh, We are in a performance mode. Somehow we feel like that we have to perform in certain fashions in order to somehow please God, to somehow pay for our sins uh, by performing in an acceptable manner before God by living this good life. Well, the writer comes along now and he's talking about a better sacrifice. This whole book is about better. Uh, The new covenant being better than the old covenant. Now, I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning on why the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was so much better than the sacrificial system of the old covenant. Hope you got a pen and a paper and let's dig in for a few minutes in these 18 verses. Now the first thing that I want you to see in this progression is this. It's the inadequacy of the Old Covenant. The inadequacy of the Old Covenant. Pick it up in verse 1. For the law having a shadow of things, matter of fact underline that word shadow, of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So he's saying that Jesus is a better sacrifice because of the insufficiency of the Old Covenant, how that the Old Covenant fell miserably short of the standards of God. He goes on to call it a shadow, if you will. Now, what what does that really mean? Well, if I had a set of blueprints up here before me, you you understand that those blueprints don't constitute a building. You you and I could go to my house, and uh, I promise you there are dozens of cookbooks in the cabinets of my house. Some of them got dust on them about that thick, but there are dozens of cookbooks at my house. 
cookbooks don't constitute a meal. You can have all of them around, but if you don't, it's just a shadow of uh, the reality of that meal. So here, this picture that he's saying here in the Word of God is really not the same as the person. So under the Old Covenant, it was a foretaste of the reality that was to come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as he would die on the cross for our sins. Now, the logic behind that is in verse number two. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. The fact that those sacrifices had to be repeated over and over and over again was proof positive. It was a fact that the law was incapable of dealing with the tyranny and the power of sin in our life. That's why it had to be repeated over and over again. Now, when I was 51 years old, um, I was diagnosed with heart disease. My LAD was 100% blocked. My RCA was 95%. I had another one that was 85%. And uh, they went and put stents in. And then they put me on some medication uh, for the heart disease. Now, the medication can't cure heart disease. It just keeps it from getting worse. That's what the law was. The law couldn't cure the disease of sin. Uh, but it just kept it really from getting worse. It was a sort of this medicine thing is sort of a symbol of that old sacrificial system. Watch verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, have, have you ever gone out with another couple this happened to me just recently. Have you ever gone out with somebody and uh, one or the other of the mate of that other couple was always pointing out the discrepancies in the other person's life? Always pointing out the shortcomings of the other person's life? Always pointing out the deficiency in their mate and over and over again in his weaknesses? I, you, you, <laughs> You ever get really hungry, miss breakfast, starve to death? You got a lunch appointment with somebody and you can't wait to get to the restaurant. I mean, you're, fam you're absolutely just starved to death. And uh, man, you go in there and you order a, a double cheeseburger with French fries and onion rings and all that stuff. I mean, you're really hungry <clears throat> and they order a salad with just some, some, some huh? nothing on it. And, and then they're sitting there looking at your, looking at your food. You, you, you ought not to be eating that. Do you know how many calories are in that hamburger that you're eating? And, and I, I make it a point not to go with anybody like that, really. I, I, I really do. I, I avoid that. You, you see, it, reminding us of the faith, that was the old covenant. The, the fact that it had to be repeated over and over again was a reminder to them that it didn't work and that our access to God had not been fully opened up yet. That was the law. Now, now, number two is the incarnation of the Messiah. The incarnation of the Messiah. Woven all through chapter number 10 is the fact that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he was a man for 33 years and he came, wrapped himself up in human flesh to finish the work of Christ. Now, watch this in verse five. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, uh, you, you've had no pleasure. Then, then I said, I come in the volume of the book it's written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you would not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now I want to give you three things. I want to give you first of all sacrifice and then I want to give you submission and then third, I want to talk to you about substitute that is outlined in these few verses. 
So let's look, for, first of all, at sacrifice. In verses 5 and 6, it's a quote from Psalm 40. Psalm 40 was saying, this is yet to come. It's on the way. The prophecy is here. The reality is about to show up. And then here in verses 5 and 6, he says the reality has come. The prophecy now has been fulfilled. And these, these offerings, these lambs, these goats, these bulls, all this blood, all of these sacrifices were made in an attempt by performance to please God. Now, I want to make a big, big statement. Those of you that are, are, are watching uh, on live stream, I want you to listen very carefully what I'm about. But I don't want you to tune me out after I make it because I'm going to come back and I'll wrap it up and it'll make more sense to you. The work of salvation for your souls is a total work of God. You see, he came to this earth to prepare his body to be an atoning sacrifice which alone could uniquely pay the penalty for your sin and the guilt of your sin. Verse 6 says that in these burnt offerings and sacrifices, God didn't have any pleasure in them. That they were no good to him. You, uh, you understand, God is not pleased when we get into this performance syndrome. We make a determination. Well, in order for me to please God, in order for me to be right with God, I got to go do this. I got to do, we make us a laundry list and we say, I got to go do this, 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 and this. And then when I come to the end of the day, I believe God would be pleased with what I have decided to do with my life to give him the praise for it. Now, uh, that doesn't mean, now listen, what I'm telling you, that doesn't mean, by the way, that's heresy. Let me just bring that to point. That's heresy to think that you can do all of that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that we don't serve God. That doesn't mean that we don't bring our talents and our gifts and our abilities to God. It doesn't mean that we don't discover what our spiritual gift is and plug that in for the glory of God. But the motivation behind those things has got to be different. You've got to understand when you do that, you don't do it as a performance trap in somehow trying to gain God's approval for your life and forgiveness for your sins you take what God has uniquely gifted you to do in and out of a motive of thanksgiving and adoration and praise for what God has done in the salvation of your soul. Major difference that we're just excited to serve because what Jesus has already done for us, not for what we can get God to do for us. Now, at the end of the day, it's not racking up a bunch of brownie points. You, you, when you get to studying the Old Testament, folks, you're going to find over and over and over again, God got sick and tired of the nation of Israel trying through these offerings and through these sacrifices to gain God's approval. Let me give you a few of them if you'll bear with me just a minute. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11, the Bible says, for what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I, I'm, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and fed, of, uh, uh, fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of egoats. God said, I'm up to here with that stuff. You're about to choke me to death with your attempt to get forgiveness for your sins through these sacrifices. Now, watch in, in Jeremiah 6, 20. He says, to what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. Hmm. Uh, to what purpose do you bring this incense from Sheba? Let me give you just a 21st century paraphrase. That perfume you bought down at Nordstrom's is about to make me sick. Literally is what he's saying. Now, I'll give you one more, maybe a couple more. In, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, he said, For I desired mercy. That's what we were talking and singing about a few minutes ago. I desired mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The big one, though, is in Micah chapter 6. He says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with the calves of a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, you want me to offer up my baby to you? He hath showed you, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to have mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. God says, don't bring me that old junk of rams and bulls and goats and burn them up on some fire thinking you're doing me a favor. He says, I'm more interested in how you live. I'm more interested in the way that you walk. I'm more interested in how you act. I'm not real interested in that other stuff. So what he was doing was preparing the nation of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Number th the second word in there is the word submission. We find it in verse seven and we find it again in verse number nine. He says, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Again in verse nine, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That is submission. That's how God wants us to come. He doesn't want us to get up every morning and say, okay, these are the 17 things that I'm going to do today that I know that when I come to the sunset of today and look back on how I did those 17 things, God, you've got to be pleased with the way that I lived. That's not it at all. God says, I want you to give a blank sheet of paper and I want you to sign your name at the bottom of that and I want you to hand it back to me and say, God, you fill in the blanks. You tell me what you want me to do. I was out of town a week or so ago and I had just checked in. It was a Sunday and I had to preach that night. I checked into the hotel, was getting ready to leave to go to the church. And, and, and the clerk, uh, just uh, the Lord just kind of opened my eyes to see. And I, I got to talking to her about the Lord. And, and she got to tell me how, what a believer that she was. And she said, you know, Pastor, I need some prayer. Would you pray for me? I said, what do you want me to pray for you about? And she said, well, Pastor, I, I'm real active in my church and I started this ministry in my church and it failed and I started this ministry in my church because I knew that the church needed this. I could tell and understand that this was something that the church would benefit by it, so I started it and it didn't work and I started this thing over here and said, Pastor, I'm just exasperated and, and, and I, I feel like a failure and I don't know what to do. Pastor, would you, would you give me some words of wisdom? And I said, yes, ma'am, I sure will. Now, you may feel a little bit different about me when I tell you what I told her, but I said, first thing you need to do is just shut up and sit down. She said, what? I said, yeah. You've tried all of this stuff out here in your own strength, in your own ingenuity, in your own burden. I said, why don't you get alone with God and be quiet and listen until God gives you the instructions that he wants you to do, and you're gonna bear fruit when you do. That's what the word submission here. Jesus submitted himself to the will of God and the will of God happened to be that he would die on a cross for the sins of the world. And then there's the word substitute that we find again in verse number nine. Then he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Now, hear my heart a minute. When you're studying the book of Hebrews, keep this in mind because verse nine is the argument of the entire book of Hebrews. He, he, you understand God dealt with the people of Israel under the old covenant in one way and he deals with people under the new covenant in an entirely different way. Now I'm finding out something about me, I, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, I don't know yet, but I, I'm finding that... Uh, I like some of the old stuff. Now you get in my car and I start my car up, you really may be surprised at what comes on the radio. I don't like this new music. I like the old music. And you're gonna find the music is gonna be in the 60s and the 70s when the temptations, can I get a witness from anybody in the house? You know, you, you know. the drifters, I pay good money to go see the drifters. You, you're going to find, I, I like some, I, I was thinking too in getting ready for today about 
how it was when I was a kid, I used to churn butter. Did y'all ever, anybody, probably not that old in here this morning, but I used to, we used to make our own butter and my job was to churn. And, and, and you know, you can't go buy butter at the store that tastes like it did back in the good old days when you'd take that and that butter and you'd put, put it on a good buttermilk biscuit. Whoo, glory. But there's, there's not a woman in this place that would like to go back to those good old days where she had to churn butter to put it on the table. You, you just wouldn't want to do that. The writer says, the old has come, it's been set aside, the new has arrived, don't revert back into the old system because the new is so much better. We are no longer made right with God with the blood of goats and calves, but by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God once and for all. Now, let me give you number three. Is the incomparable sacrifice of Jesus. We find this in verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Now there's a lot of loosey-goosey teaching that goes on about sanctification. And I want, to, I want to clarify that if I could because there's a lot of people out there that says that sanctification is progressive. That it is a process. When I got saved, they will say, you know, God started the, sacrifi- the, the, the sanctification process in my, uh, in my spirit and in my body and in my life and I'm better now than I was back then, but I still got a long ways to go in this process of sanctification. Wrong. Not scriptural. If you look right here, you'll see a perfect participle that is connected with a finite verb in the structure of this Greek. And it shows that the believer is fixed. It is a permanent position that is made holy by the blood of Jesus. Now you say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, here it is. The very moment that you turned away from sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is that instantaneously from God's perspective, you were made holy. You were sanctified. From God's perspective, you are as sanctified as you will ever be. Now, we spend our time here on this life trying to get our practice up to the standard and the level of our position. That's where the discrepancy is, you you, you see. But from, from God's perspective, we're already made Holy, the Bible says here, once for all. It's a done deal. It's successful. It's still standing. I've been set free from the power of sin. I've been set free, as we sang about, from the penalty of sin. One of these days, I'm going to be set free from the practice of sin. Can somebody say amen? You can't make me, and you can't become more wit sanctified no matter how many conferences you may attend no matter how many studies you may participate in from God's perspective you're as sanctified made holy as you will ever get you need to rest in that now you say why are you saying that listen because your performance cannot clean up your life Only the blood of Jesus can clean you up. Look at verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You know that there was no chair. There was no chair in in, in this place of sacrifice. Why? Because the priest never finished. Verse 12. But this man after he had offered up one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Why did Jesus sit down? He was finished. 
He was complete. Once and for all. Done. Look at verse 13. From henceforth expecting till his enemies he made his footstool. One of the things about the sacrifices in the Old Testament is they never did anything in the world to get rid of Satan. But the sacrifice of Jesus reached all the way down to the very pit of hell itself. And there is coming a day that the grossest of all enemies of the Lord are going to bow their knee to Jesus and declare that he is Lord. Now here's the deal. You will either voluntarily bow your knee to the Lord here or you will involuntarily bow your knee and declare him as Lord in hell. And the choice really is yours. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected, what's the next two words? Say it real loud. Ooh wee. Let me read that again. Just make sure now. I don't, want to, I don't want to misread this. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. <laughs> now you look around and you see a lot of people are not here at 930 because the Panthers played at 930 and they stayed home. Now the quarterback's number one fear today is not losing the game. The quarterback's number one fear today is not throwing an interception. The quarterback's number one fear today is that I don't want to fumble that ball again. Hmm? That's his number one fear. The number one fear that most people that I know about today is that they come to the end of the way and they really struggle. Am I saved? Am I forgiven? Uh, am, am, I, am I going to make it in? But here's another one of those verses, ladies and gentlemen, that absolutely nail it for us. God has perfected forever them that are sanctified. You're sealed till the day of redemption. Your salvation can't be lost. You're right there in the palm of the hand of God. Now watch this. Number four is the ideal covenant. That's the one that we live under. That's the one that we rejoice in. Jeremiah 31 looked ahead and prophesied that this covenant is coming. Here in Hebrews 10, looking back, and he says the new covenant is a reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pick it up in verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said before, look at verse 16. Oh, it's so powerful. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. No longer was it external. He says, I'm going to put it in their hearts. I'm going to put it in their minds. What's he talking about there, Jay? He's talking about a relationship with Christ. A relationship with the king of glory. It's not how many brownie points that you rack up in a given day. It's a matter of having a personal, intimate relationship with the God of this universe through his son, Jesus. Look at verse 17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. My flesh does this. Satan does this with me. We talked about it last week. He wants to bring up our past. He wants to bring up our sins. And when he does, boom, suddenly God has a quick case of amnesia. I don't remember your sins anymore. That's so different than a human level, isn't it? Aren't we pretty quick to remind each other of the past? Honey, let me back the car out for you. 
What do you, what do you want to back the car out for me before? I, I, why, why do you want to do that? I, I'm capable of backing out. I know you've backed it out several times. I've, I've already replaced the garage door 14 times. Mm. On a human level, we've got a way of bringing up that past, haven't we? we? We've got a way of dragging it up against other people. We do it all of the time. But aren't you glad that God says, I will remember your sins no more. Verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. You understand that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross ended all sacrifice forever and ever. I pulled this little, uh, this little children's song up that I used to sing many, many years ago. It says, gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Praise God, my sins are gone. Do y'all remember singing that little song? You see, the sacrifice is done. All that's left now is for you to receive that free gift of salvation into your heart and into your life. So here's the big question that I want to ask you today and we'll close. What are you really trusting in? When it comes to the end of the way, what, where is your trust? Is your trust in how good of a person that you've been in your life? Is your trust in the fact that your good somehow is going to outweigh your bad. And the real question is, is when you stand before God and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What is your answer going to be? Well, you know what? Uh, Lord, I, I did my best. I treated other people the way that I would want to be treated. I was very generous. I was kind. I was not ugly. I did good for other people. And God's going to say, depart from me. I never need you. I never need you. Or would you be able to say, Father, there was a day that I placed my faith and my trust in the finished work of Jesus and his sacrifice of himself on Calvary's cross. And my trust is in him. You understand that's the only acceptable answer. And I wonder how many of you today need to transfer your trust in whatever it is that you're trusting in over onto the only trustworthy one, and that's Jesus. Do you need to transfer your trust? You need to place your faith and trust in Jesus. Do you have the assurance today that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? My prayer is, is that you do. Would you stand with me and let's pray together for a few minutes. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege today of just digging into your word for a few minutes. I thank you, Lord, for the power and the strength and the validity of your word. I pray that it'll bear much fruit for the cause of Christ, for Jesus' sake. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.